Boom, we're live. Nathan, thank you for coming on the show. I got to start with the first question, yeah. which is, what is your favorite superhero? Oh, um, when I was a teenager, it was Nightcrawler on X-Men. Nightcrawler. Wow. Yeah. He could disappear really easily. Um, there was a X-Men arcade game that I, that I would play that, um, and he was my favorite, like his function and his design. And ah. Was, I think Iron Man was also on that game, but I don't remember if I'm confusing the two. And then shortly after that, X-Men Children of the Atom came out. Mm. Um, are you old enough to know what that is? <laughs> I don't think so. It's a, it's a Mortal Kombat style X-Men game. Okay. Yeah, I think I played that. Yeah. And uh, I looked it up the other day because uh, for nostalgic reasons and <laughs> it, uh, the graphics, I thought the graphics <laughs> were a lot better back then. I mean, they were. They were awesome. And the moves were great. You could play Storm and you could play Wolverine. And um, I don't think there's really been an X-Men game that rivals it, actually. That's crazy. Um, yeah. I also loved Batman a lot uh, uh -huh. when I got older. I think Batman was probably my favorite. And then I always dress up as Superman um, when I yep. was eight years old for Halloween and when I was 30 years old for Halloween. And so I think I think I like to embody Superman. Yep. But the real nerd in me likes X-Men, likes Nightcrawler the most. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Nightcrawler, I have not heard that. The most interesting... It's probably the most interesting. One of the most out there ones was um, Moses. Oh, I don't know who that is. Moses, like the okay. biblical Moses. Oh, sorry. I thought you were referring to a character. No, uh, exactly. Yeah, he's really out there. Nobody, I don't know. He, yeah, he's like, I don't know, sort of an underdog, I guess. Um, right. But he's awesome. He's got awesome power. So from that, <clears throat> so Nightcrawler, the ability to disappear, Superman, the ability to embody like this amazing ultimate power and immunity against disease and death and <laughs> exactly so how did your story start we got to dive into the thyroid cancer and just where your journey began into this realm of health and uh well-being oh well um well if you want to start with the disease part that started a long time ago um i think the earliest I, I think I had thyroid disease pretty much my whole childhood. Mm. Um, and, but unlike a lot of other kids and young people that have thyroid disease, I didn't have weight problems. But um, I had early onset depression, um, low energy levels. And even though I was an athlete, and, and being an athlete made it worse, I, I was a basketball player. Mm. Um, but I broke my knee in ninth grade trying out for the team. I still made cuts, though. Um, <laughs> But uh, I couldn't run anymore, so I took up swimming. And swimming, um, not only are, are you practicing in chlorine all day long, um, we had a, one of those pools that had a bubble on it, so you're also breathing in all the chlorine fumes. And, and also when you exert yourself, your skin absorbs air and, and minerals and things more readily, so when you practicing in chlorine where your heart rate gets up is a lot different than just recreating in chlorine water and that zapped you know all the iodine and vitamin c out of my body and um so so my health problems kind of were like mm -hmm. pretty much lifelong um culminating fast forward to many years later when i'm an adult and my health is just going down and down and down and no matter how hard i try i can't uh, stay in shape. I can't sleep. I can't, um, be healthy, lose weight. Um, and, and, and emotionally too, like, you know, mm -hmm. our, our bodies, a lot of people kind of consider the mind to be separate from the body and health, which is ridiculous because yeah. the brain is a physical organ. It's affected by, um, health and nutrition just as much as the rest of the body. So my life kind of blew up. Uh, oh, and, um, so I was an alcoholic too, and I, I drank a lot to to deal with all the pain that I was feeling, not just emotional, but yeah. physical. And but that also has consequences, and my life just completely fell apart. And I uh, found out that I had tumors on my thyroid, and that actually took a while because I, I knew something was wrong. I didn't think it was that serious, and I would go to doctors, and they would see, you know, a 
late 20s, early 30 white boy, and they would just say, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with you, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous because I would walk in there, um, even when I was 300 pounds and losing my hair and just obviously like exhausted looking, I would go into doctor's offices and they would like run some standard tests and then they would tell me that, I, well, they would tell me I was fine, but they would always say, this. the earliest this happened, I think was in 2009, doctors uh they started telling me that i had white high white blood cell count mm. um which it turns out is a really like obvious hallmark of cancer if you don't have um other infections and i i didn't have other infections mm. and it's really strange that none of those doctors said oh hey you know this actually is an indicator of like something that could be a real problem and anyway so and then I, I would go to different doctors because I'd you know move around or like my ex and I we moved out to Palm Springs in 2011. Mm -hmm. But then doctors I was getting sicker and sicker and doctors were even le getting less and less helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I started. Well, I was doing a lot of my own like investigation yeah. into health things um, for a while, but that really started to ramp up as I got really really ill, and I started to deduce that I had. A thyroid condition and so I started like um, you know eating in ways and taking supplements that could like supposedly help it yeah um, early on those were not like correct but then I ran across you know like repeat stuff yep. and things like that and that was the first time. and I obviously I get science like really well and that was the first time I ever actually read something that jived with what I already knew yeah. um, I had like I mentioned this in my book I had like before that, I had read this. I had like, I was like, what? I, I was like, I gotta find uh, an authority that knows what they're talking about. And I, th I was thought for a minute about, okay, you know, like whoever is responsible for Chris Hemsworth's body, yeah, <laughs> ought to know <laughs> what the deal is going on with the human body. Yeah. Right? So I like look up like who's Chris Hemsworth's nutritionist, and there's like this like woman who's like really nice and really pretty, and she's got like these books out. And so I, I got her book. And like I started reading it and it was all about like, it's basically promoting vegetarianism. Um, mm -hmm. It was talking about how like meat can rot in your intestinal system. And, and, and on the surface of it, it can kind of sound like maybe there's some truth there, but the more you think about it, the more yeah. um, logical fallacy it is. So um, anyway, so when I got to Ray P, he was talking about specific molecules, the specific way they worked and everything that he said correlated exactly with my personal experience like you know, trying to do low carb. Um, a, a previous doctor had given me a whole tub of fish oil to deal with my thyroid problem. Yeah. She'd also given me thyroid medication. So they kind of like sort of canceled <laughs> each other out. Yeah. But, but ultimately that, that fish oil just, it destroyed. That was also right at the time that my health just started. There were some other things like I did an extreme low carb diet at that time. So there was a kind of a perfect storm of things that came together. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, so anyway, so his stuff, like matched perfectly with what I was experiencing. I was like, this is it, this is the answer. So I just kept going with that and I kept learning through his thing. And, and, and then, you know, after I got to a point where I read all of his articles and, and yeah. listened to mo a lot of his interviews, not all of them, but, um, I, and I still wasn't getting to where I needed to be. Oh, sorry. And then at this time I got diagnosed with tumors on my thyroid, mm. lost my health insurance, which actually was good because if I had gone, through treatment they would have like removed or destroyed my thyroid and i didn't really want that anyway so and i already kind of knew and i already had this idea that i could fix my health on my own without uh that kind of drastic intervention so um oh so then i got to this point though where repeats information was only had only gotten me so far gotten me far but only so yeah. far so i kept doing my own work and yeah and then that's how i got to where i am now Wow. Just lots of studying and personal experimentation. Totally. <clears throat> I mean, that is to go, but you, have you had since then your tumor or the tumor like uh, proof to show that it's like completely gone? Like, you no, I haven't really had much to do with doctors in the last like three years because yeah. like, I got, after I moved back to LA and I got working mm -hmm. and I got health insurance again. I went to a doctor again to like, you know, and at this point I was already doing all this work on myself. Yeah. I went to this doctor to like, you know, do checkups and see how everything was going. And he was probably the worst one I had ever been with. And I was just like, 
fuck these people. I'm so tired of it. I, I would like to have um, some more investigative stuff in the future, but more to like explore other areas that I haven't been able to get into. Totally. Um, because the, the thing is, is like, you know, when you have a lot of, a lot of the dialogue around cancer is that it's this mysterious disease that suddenly takes you in the middle of the night without warning. And it doesn't work that way. No. Cancer always is accompanied by other symptoms. They might not be like, you know, oh, I'm bleeding internally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're like, I have really extreme insomnia where I don't sleep at all every single night. And, but even that one won't be alone meaning you have cancer. It just means that like they're like mine were like a really bad edema in my, in my fingers when wow. I would just walk around the block with my dogs. In addition to having horrible insomnia and horrible waking and losing my hair, mm. like, there, are, there are symptoms that accompany it. So when those symptoms completely started going away, it was clear that the cancer was no longer functional in my body. Um, the tumor is not what kills you. It's the hormones that the tumor excretes. Yeah. People have tumors all over their body. As you start to get older, <laughs> um, uh, one that's really weird are lipoma, which are little fatty tumors that you'll find. And you'll be like, what the fuck is this <laughs> lump? Yeah. Um, and, uh, but those, those are benign though. Um, but people develop tumors as you get older. Tumors aren't really the problem. If they get really huge, they can be a problem. But you've seen people walk around with like, you know, Massive. on the graphic and whatever, they have like giant. My, um, one of my nephews had a brain tumor at two years old that was as big as an apple. You know, like, um, yeah. So kids heads are only as big as a watermelon <laughs> i'm not a watermelon a melon. and um uh he's fine they cut it out and he's doing great he hasn't had any recurrence and i got my sister to help change their diets and stuff like that totally so um yeah the tumors aren't the problem it's the hormones that they excrete and like a lot of the therapies that i talk about in my book work to actually quiet the tumor and turn off its activity and then it stops being a problem of course if you still have the tumor and you get sick again later it can like maybe reignite but mm -hmm. you know and in that case and in my book i do recommend that people get them taken out but not irradiated or those like extreme treatments yeah. if they can and if that's their choice um uh but if, if the tumor is big enough but you can still like live with it so totally yeah and i was i read um some of the work by dr Tennant, and uh, he was um so he takes the his book's called healing is voltage um and he takes the you did send me that i hadn't looked at it yet though yeah so he takes the approach of uh physics on it and he literally was like chemotherapy has never had a double blind study like there's almost no nothing that shows that it works and yeah. the people who lived longer on the studies ended up dying because their organs were failing yeah it's like i've seen enough i had a friend whose mom died after right after chemo and she went in for treatment. Like she went in, didn't even know she had cancer, but she was sick. Mm -hmm. Found out she had cancer and then died just like six months later during treatment. And the, cause the treatment, they like shove this big long needle up her spine to inject it with chemotherapy. And I just, the logic of that, like a person can't, I just can't imagine a person surviving something that traumatic. No. Let alone, you know, and especially your body's in such a hard condition. Yeah. The title of that book made me think back to when I was first trying to get healthy. I think I was like 28 or 29 and mm -hmm. I went to an actual nutritionist and she was really expensive. And I, I went and she hooked me up to this machine that measures your voltage. Really? Yeah. It was the weirdest thing. It was a little Star trek -y, um, but it only gave out a little bit of readings and she put like one note on like, I think um, somewhere on my hand or upper body and then another one on my feet. And it would like measure your voltage from like zero to five. And I came in at a three and she told me that people at a two, one or zero die. <laughs> so I was like <laughs> really worried. And so I'm like, how do I fix it? And she was like, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. And she gave me no diet plan. We just like talked about some stuff for a while and she didn't give me any diet plan, really no insight. Um, but she told me, she did tell me to eat more salt. Hmm. It was, was actually pretty intuitive of her because sodium does it, it increases your electrical conductivity yeah exactly um yeah man okay so so we get to dive into disease and thyroid and really just how how misinformation is being spread about what to do to heal anything to get healthy and 
normally what is happening is we're seeing either a placebo effect or people becoming so stressed out through uh, catecholamines that it makes them feel good. Oh yeah. 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 Um, that, yeah, that has a lot, like, like I wrote an article recently about fasting and like a lot of those stress approaches mm -hmm. to healing pump up your endorphins and make you feel like you're doing something really good. When I uh, was 27 or 28, I experimented with resveratrol mm. and um, it got me of it. 5 a.m. out the door running, like it made me just feel like I could like just do whatever I wanted. Um, but it also made me feel really agitated and um, after a little while. But initially I took that surge in energy as a sign that it was something that was like good for me. Mm -hmm. But what was really happening is that resveratrol raises your cortisol like crazy. And so it'll get you up really early in the morning and it makes you um, uh, like feel like you got to go out and hunt and like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like there's kind of like, well, I mean, which one, there's two camps. There's like the Ray Peak camp of stimulation and thyroid, but mm -hmm. then there's also like uh, other uh, health um, camps that, uh, do stimulation stuff to get the, their energy levels up. Yeah. I mean, let's just dive into really how most people, because I would say most people aren't in any camp that actually is anything. Uh, any of the information is either holistic, fits into a system, or will give you the longevity. Most people are running around and then taking something which lets them run around more, and they think it's a, uh, a puzzle piece that goes into it and fixes everything, but really it's a puzzle piece of just a greater system. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you take, even take, for instance, people on thyroid medication and mm -hmm. I took thyroid medication for um, a couple of years and it can be really helpful. And in, in some cases it's needed in order to get you up from that really low yeah. place. If your metabolic rate is really, really low. Um, but what thyroid doesn't medication doesn't do is heal your thyroid. And that was one of the things that I had a real hard time with, with when I was early in the repeat stuff was I was taking the thyroid medication all the time and it would like alleviate my symptoms. But mm -hmm. if I just stopped, if I stopped for even just two or three days, all my symptoms would come back. So it was it clearly in some people who are really lucky, it could help heal if you're yeah. not, but generally people that are already there are pretty ill and um, thyroid can fix a lot of things, but it, it can't actually heal your thyroid. And that's because the underlying conditions that cause the thyroid disease are not addressed by the medication. Um, and that's where my approach in my book goes in, where I talk about how vitamin C functions in the body to promote thyroid and, and those kinds of things. Um, uh, yeah. And then, you know, we, then you go, um, go with like uh, people who work out and they take like pre-workout, yeah. right? pre-workout gives them like this pump and they feel like energized and they're going out there and hitting it hard. Um, like the pre-workout, like, you know, caffeine is actually pretty good. Like it, it's protective yeah. of a lot of things. It really helps your body. So that's fine. But then there are other things in it, like nit uh, nitric oxide boosters that, um, you know, nitric oxide has a really important function in our body. It, it, it dilates blood vessels and, and gets more nutrients and oxygen to your cells. But what it also does is shut down your mitochondria. So, you know, and then you, and then you can see how this works with, um, like, you know, older people who take mm -hmm. like, uh, erectile uh, um, medications, uh, how they age really, really quickly. And also like, you know, if you compare kind of like today's, um, body built, young bodybuilders with the ones that came uh, just a little bit a generation ago, yeah. uh, they age a lot, have aged a lot more quickly. They get, you know, really thin skin. It's a little bit more ashen. Um, their hair is falling out at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's because of nitric oxide is not a healing. It's a stress response chemical. Oh, yeah. it, it's supposed to be excreted acutely, not chronically. So when you elevate it chronically, it shuts down your mitochondria and causes all the other problems. Anyway. So yeah, like, you know, and what else do, I mean, like, um, there's, uh, I mean, there's a ridiculous amount of things. Yeah. One of the one of the most critical things that have actually helped me is iodine uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think there's there's mo many camps on it. I've been doing very high dose iodine therapy yeah. uh, 
50 milligrams a day. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to back off eventually, but I was realizing all the water I've been drinking for like ever is fluoride, has fluoride in it. Yeah. Chlorine pools, showers, everything. And so like I've changed all of that recently and my hands and feet are always warm. There's yeah. never not. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, iodine, you know, uh, Ray Pete doesn't really like iodine and it's really common. A lot of doctors, you know, but it's so weird how there's so much, um, conflicting, uh, ideas on iodine. Mm -hmm. Um, basically the medical profession says it causes both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, which is ridiculous because it can't cause both. Yeah. I mean, you could maybe cause hyperthyroidism and then destroy your thyroid and then get hypothyroidism, but, um, iodine doesn't really work that way. And then, um, uh, unsaturated fats uh, dilute iodine, they bind it. So that's one of the mechanisms why um, polyunsaturated fats slow down the thyroid is because they actually um, uh, rob iodine from the body. So, uh, and then um, iodine can cause some hypothyroidism when you first mm -hmm. take it. Like if you, there's a lot of things that work that way in our body. Like if you have a deficiency of calcium for a really long time, your prolactin will be really high. Um, and your um, parathyroid hormone and so and then you take a huge dose of calcium your body is like running as if you don't have any calcium so then you put in this huge amount and it suddenly just goes overboard and makes you sick so iodine is the same way when you have really really low iodine your body is um has is activated certain pathways to uh conserve and um uh uh, uh, uh you know well, whatever, uh, iodine. And um, then you take a big dose of it, it can, it does actually like cause a hyperthyroid state, but that usually only lasts for like a couple days. Um, and then, it, and then it evens out. And um, uh, uh, yeah, like, and every time that I took iodine, like I initially started with like, I was afraid because I read a lot of stuff about it and it made it sound like this like demon yeah. molecule. And so I was really afraid to take a lot. So I would buy these like, you know, holistic little vials at Whole Foods that contained like small doses, like um, 600 uh, micrograms. And I thought yeah. that was like, a lot because like the daily recommended is like, what, 10? I, no, yeah. 100 micrograms. It's like a, such a tiny, tiny amount. Doctors used to give people up to a, an entire gram of iodine to treat diseases like syphilis and stuff like that. Yeah. And you can actually get a really funky um, side effect from too much iodine, like two or three or four grams of it, where you get these like big purple boils on your skin. And it's, it's, it's the body getting rid of that much iodine. But that's ridiculous, like to take that much iodine. Yeah. Like, that, no one's going to do that. Um, but you, and that's like, that's multiple grams of iodine, not, you know, where 10 to 50 milligrams, you know, every day or once in a while. Yep. Not even close to that. And um, so it'll detox, you know, um, uh, or restrain unsaturated fats, especially if you're releasing those fatty acids into your bloodstream and then you take some iodine, it'll, mm -hmm. it can help. That's one of the reasons why it does make you warm and gets your, uh, meta, it can help mm -hmm. your and I've worked with a lot of people who like, you know, they get stuck at like their temperatures are at like 90, um, like low 98 and they can't get up to yep. 99 and then they take some iodine and, and it goes and it goes like crazy and they, and they get up there and it's really helpful. Oh, yeah. And also with stuff about iodine, like also it can complex with mercury and help get let out some a little thing. That, that's not its like big function. I don't think it does that like super well, but you know, it, it just has all these benefits that I don't see why we shouldn't use it. Yeah. Yeah. And with, I mean, the thing is like most people live in cities or in somewhere too with horrible water now. They have like horrible noise pollution, sound pollution, um, air pollution, and they don't realize it. And the stress of that and how that affects everything. I'm like, I mean, if I could just take a little iodine every day or, and I know you're big on this molecule, progesterone, and I wanted to ask you um, your thoughts on it, how it works and uh, what like a dosage to actually use it to heal yourself would be. Yeah, progesterone is crazy because like, okay, there was this point when I was like 34 when I almost died. Like I, I yeah. had a couple nights where I was, I could not sleep at all for days. I was in so much pain and um, my body temperature, I just started measuring my body temperature mm -hmm. 
and it was it would hit uh, low 95, 95.1 every morning. It was really wow. it hurt the most that I've ever hurt in my whole um, experience. And this was like before I really started getting into repeat. I mean, this is right when I started getting into repeat. Yeah. And um, I'd read about progesterone, but I read it was a female hormone, and so I didn't wasn't going to use it, right? But I had also read that it increased thyroid function powerfully and it could be used therapeutically. And I was already so fat and miserable and like my ex was being horrible to me. And I just was like, fuck it. I don't care what I look like. I just mm -hmm. don't want to die. So I ordered some and I took it right away. And I just, I took it. I also had read that you need to take it in larger doses mm -hmm. for it to, to be effective. And so I did that. And um, right away, my temperature started coming right back up. It was crazy how um, how 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 powerfully and quickly it worked because I'd been trying a bunch of other things but wasn't really that good at it yet, and um, it worked really well for like like a month or two. My temperature just kept coming up and coming up and coming up, um, and I also at first didn't see any of the side effects that I was worried about, like you know hearing that um, it can make your penis smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that. That didn't happen actually the first for the first like month the opposite happened it was yeah. it, it increased my libido and performance and i hadn't had a really good functioning libido yeah. for a while so that was actually like really exciting um i did start to gain weight after about two months ish mm. but that was you know that was long before i understood how it actually worked and progesterone essentially makes your body work better so if you are exposed to stress you know, things like SIBO, like bat, like, um, yeah. bacteria, like gut dysbiosis, um, you are going to gain weight on progesterone because weight gain is protective from dying. Like your body wants to keep you, um, uh, alive. It's going to do what it needs to. So taking progesterone, if you're that stressed out, it, it will make you gain some weight at first, but there are other, th you can address that gut, that the gut imbalance you can um, take vitamin C, iodine, and all these other things that I didn't know back then that mit that prevent that weight gain. Cause that weight gain is just a response to those other mm -hmm. stressful factors. It's not actually a function of progesterone. And a lot of people confuse that and then don't take progesterone. Like my, like my mom, <laughs> she like won't take progesterone cause she thinks it makes her gain weight, but she also won't do wow. the other things that address gut function, you know, avoiding gluten and, and you know, things like that. Uh, not gluten and all gluten, but the bad gluten. Totally. So, because if you don't know, like my, I, I promote bread consumption. If it's like heirloom flour with like yep. yeast, great. Yeah. So good. Um, though. It's, yeah. I mean, it tastes better too. Yeah. Do you, do you um, eat it or make it? I, I, I don't make it. I'll find it sometimes and I'll have it. Um, I'm very I, like. Making bread is so much fun. And it's actually, it's, it seems really hard when you get into it. Yeah. Uh, but once you know, once you understand um, the process, it's actually really easy. Really? And, cut down your food bill like crazy. Um, one of the things, cause the yeast make us the special form of um, nicotinamide, which is um, they make nicotinamide riboside. Mm -hmm. um, and we make that, that's the kind that our bodies synthesize, um, but you can't get that in other uh, foods. And so when you eat a lot of homemade yeast risen bread, you actually are more satiated because you have higher amounts of wow. uh, special niacinamide in your body. Um, and yeah, and then it just tastes fucking good anyway. So yeah, okay. Well, now I'm gonna be baking bread. Yeah, that is awesome. That is Wait, awesome. you're talking about um, progesterone. So yes. okay, um, again. Oh, okay. So then I was okay, and then after I was taking it for like a while, I forget how long because it was a long time ago. But then I did start to experience a decline in my libido. So and I already got my temperatures up pretty good because of it. In fact, there was a point where um, my temperatures got so high from progesterone I, I would hit 101 like um every like every day using really? progesterone. yeah um and um but also it wasn't like a really good feeling because this is getting into too much yeah. now but um uh when if you have a pre-existing like viral infection like i have epstein-barr which i didn't know okay. about yes my mom has this yeah when your temperature gets up to that high it actually um, starts to threaten the virus and then the virus reactivates in order to keep um, being infected in your body. And then that can turn on your lymph system. So I kept, every time I used progesterone, it would raise my temperature up to hundred, 
Epstein Barr would reactivate and burden my lymph system. I didn't know this was going on at the yeah. time. And I even emailed repeat and he said that it should, that once you use progesterone, your temperature should stay up and you shouldn't be having that, but that mm -hmm. he didn't have a solution. But later I found out that that's what um, was going on. Um, and, um, uh, a part of my, in my book, I talk about viral reduction through protein fasting, which I don't recommend fasting, but there's very specifics, um, about that, that can help with viral load. And then that gets rid of that virus reaction. Cause, uh, anyway, but, um, none of that is a reason to avoid progesterone because progesterone works really, really well to restore your metabolism mm -hmm. and your health in general. It's one of the reasons why like pregnant women, like have you ever seen a, a woman get pregnant and she seems to, um, reduce in age, like age backwards yep. that that's progesterone in action that's a, that's actually what it does so um i gave it up and then i don't know how long i went i went probably like six or seven months again without it and my health started to like go down again i wasn't feeling very good so i went to progesterone again and it ma immediately made me feel relaxed it made me start sleeping better um, energy levels came back up again. My libido increased at first when I was using it. Um, then the same thing a couple months in, or maybe even at this time, it was only maybe a month or two in mm -hmm. a month in, like my libido started to tank again. And I started to gain weight again. Um, so I used it a little while and then I stopped again, everything came back. Oh, and that's the other thing too. Like none of these symptoms, like if it reduces your libido, it's not permanent at all. It, yeah. it comes back. Uh, Cause, um, anyway, so but okay, so I was like recognizing how helpful it was for me, but I wasn't sure how to keep those other things from happening. So I kept exploring it. I found out that like one of the effects of progesterone is to redirect your calcium intake and in, in back to your bones. Yep. Um, that's literally like one of its functions is like to help um, mineralize your 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 skeletal system. And so if you're not eating enough calcium. Okay, so the testicles need a high amount of calcium in order to produce testosterone as well. Yep. So if you're not eating enough calcium and you take progesterone, it actually just redirects calcium away from your testicles, so they just don't produce testosterone anymore. Mm. That's one of the mechanisms behind um, why men can see, um, well, and women too can see some side effects from um, progesterone. So like, but you know that should be taken care of with a healthy diet. Totally, and with. With that, would you recommend 5-alpha uh, dehydroxy progesterone in order to kind of mitigate that for men? Oh, you know, actually, I, don't, I actually haven't done much work or research into that. I've just used progesterone uh, uh, for all of my needs, and um, I don't even have enough knowledge on that to even say whether or not it would be helpful. Yeah. Um, but also because there's more that I learned from, about progesterone that as complete that completely negates any of those side effects. Mm. So, okay. So the weight gain problem is a lot of people's concern with progesterone. That is completely a reflection of your gut bacteria. Um, because progesterone gets rid of physical stress in a lot of places, but the one place it can't affect is your gut microbiome and that, and if you have unhelpful species in there, yeah. um, that threaten your metabolic rate, your body will respond under the influence of progesterone to store fat. So, um, you know, in my book, um, I have a chapter on um, SIBO and, and those, those gut problems. Um, it wasn't as complete as I wanted it when I released it. And, but, cause also I didn't know if I'd be able to tackle things like Candida and H. pylori. And, um, but I have now, and the, those are, I'm actually releasing an update for my book in a, oh, awesome. about a month, I think. Um, and, uh, and, and that'll address all those things. But um, so addressing your gut microbiome is uh, how you prevent weight gain on progesterone. It's not by avoiding progesterone because a lot of people really need it, like especially women that are oh, yeah. dealing with weight problems. You've got low progesterone to begin with because your body is under stress. So you it, it really helpful. And then for men that are like um, having erectile dysfunctions and mm -hmm. losing their hair and aging quickly, progesterone. Um, is like a really great way to get in there and, and, and fix and stop those things. Um, the age reversing um, quality of progesterone is enabled through a protein called ceruloplasmin. And ceruloplasmin 
is regarded by the medical community and science as primarily a copper managing protein. Mm. But every study that also uh, addresses iron storage in the body yeah. with ceruloplasmin also shows a reduction in excess iron with higher function of ceruloplasmin. Wow. Ceruloplasmin, um, and, and it, so, um, so, so it, it has this effect for um, a couple reasons. Uh, when you have high est higher estrogen and low progesterone, man or woman, um, your body absorbs and stores more copper and iron. And that's because copper and iron are really, really important for growth. Mm -hmm. So, um, and not just growth, but like healing. Um, but like the kind of healing, like you get cut and you got to read more. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. It's got to regenerate. Not like, you know, reverse age reversing. Copper yeah. and iron are really bad for age, aging. Um, but your body in a stress um, state is expecting to need those nutrients later. So it starts to um, store them in, in, for that case. But in our, the way that our contemporary diets and health work, we're under so much stress that, uh, that uh, it artificially stimulates those stress states that promote the uptake of those things when we don't actually need them. So, okay. And then you have low progesterone, so you have low ceruloplasmin mm -hmm. uh, function. What happens is you still absorb the copper and iron they just get um haphazardly deposited all over your body they go it goes and then like one of the routes of excretion for iron or the primary route for excretion of iron is through your skin so the more iron the more unrestrained iron and copper that uh, build up in your body they go into places where they actually like lower the metabolic rate and enhance aging of like your skin and other organs um so when you take progesterone, it raises ceruloplasmin, which then manages your copper and iron and helps your body excrete the excess and manage it properly. But you actually need um, the mineral molybdenum for ceruloplasmin. That's so, how you say it. What? I said that's how you say it. I, would, I always pronounce it wrong. I'm like molybdenum. Well, I don't know that I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> I, I think you're more correct than me, but I always, when I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, molybdenum. I just like have never even looked at how it's spelled. I'm just like. I had to sit, I had to sit and look at the letters for like a couple minutes just to yeah. like, like, no, I don't know. I'm an authority on a, on a lot of things, but spelling and <laughs> not one of them. Me too. Anybody who's read my, my book and like, I thought I did a pretty good job of keeping the spelling errors down in my book. And then when I was going back doing this update, I'd like run into like <laughs> so many things. And um, it doesn't help that autocorrect is like ridiculous now. Literally, the Apple autocorrect, it, it suggests misspellings. It told me the other day that, yeah. um, oh, I can't remember. Oh, in between, the word in between. It told me that in between where it's spelled with as one word was incorrect and wanted me to either hyphenate it or do in between. Yeah. yeah it's like so weird. Um, <laughs> Oh, what? Yeah, no, Grammarly, same thing, except Grammarly is even uh, weirder because they now have, like, I don't know if they create the system with a bias or something, but sometimes they're, it's, like, biased towards certain words. or like, it'll be like, no, you can't say that. Yeah. Like, it'll never work. I'm like, what? I know Thanks this works. Getting us through our autocorrect. Yeah. <laughs> Not surveillance. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so back when I started using progesterone, and it worked for a little bit of time and then kind of stopped. One of the big reasons was because progesterone by stimulating an increase in ceruloplasmin mm -hmm. by which it was um, improving my um, health and like reducing my aging, it's actually depleting you of molybdenum because you need more molybdenum yes. to make that much ceruloplasmin. And, and men don't also make ceruloplasmin the way that women do because progesterone simulates it so especially if you're a male with having health problems you're not producing progesterone and you're not producing ceruloplasmin and that, so and that's that's where uh, that is like the primary reason for the aging appearance um because you have all of this excess unrestrained copper and iron in your skin that's mm -hmm. just lowering the mitochondrial function in your skin so it's contributing to your aging <clears throat> excuse me so Okay, so um, uh, and also because molybdenum is not like ubiquitous in our uh, in our environment. Yeah, uh, you have to. It's molybdenum. I don't know. I can't think off the top of my head other food sources, but molybdenum is um, actually the taste of spring water. 
Um, it's the reason, right here. Yeah. The reason that that kind of fresh water tastes so good is molybdenum. It, that is actually the flavor of molybdenum. Um, so it, it comes from like natural water. So if you're not also drinking spring water all the time, you're really, and there's not enough in there to like be therapeutic anyway. Yeah. That's enough to keep you going. So progesterone is more helpful and its use extended if you're also taking a molybdenum supplement. Um, there was one lady who was older that was taking a really high dose of it that had some nausea from taking that. But mm -hmm. you, should, you don't need to take a high dose anyway. You just have to have it present. So a low dose is like really good. And so anyway, so that extends and keeps permanent the age-defying effects of progesterone if you have sufficient molybdenum sores. It increases your ceruloplasmin, which in turn kind of vacuum mops up all the copper and iron and then uh, makes you look better. The second part of progesterone that's a problem for men more um, is the libido part and mm. the penis effects because, you know, we don't want our penises as yeah. small enough as it is. So um, that is, I found, a function of boron, actually. Um, and there's kind of like, some people don't really like boron or they, uh, they used yeah. to love it and then some people don't like it and some people are worried that it increases your estrogen. Here's how boron works. Well, one, the, one of the best ways that boron works is apparently during a boron deficiency, your body um, increases its elimination of calcium, magnesium, and potassium, and even sodium. So if you have a boron deficiency, you actually lose those minerals like really quickly. Um, which makes it harder to retain them, obviously, yeah. or metabolic problems. And, you know, for the whole last, like, five years, well, that was longer. I've known about Pete for four years. Um, I've been putting all of this effort into getting enough calcium, getting enough magnesium, getting enough potassium, you know, and it's exhausting. You know, you're eating tons it of is. food. Yeah. But so a lot of that is a boron deficiency because <laughs> during a boron deficiency, you just excrete that really uh, all those really fast. So boron is really helpful because, so it helps you retain those things. So the, so the retention of those other minerals in a boron sufficiency is going to increase a lot of your metabolic pathways mm -hmm. under the influence of progesterone. The other thing that boron does is boron actually liberates sex hormones from the protein that circulates them through the body, which is sex binding globulin. Mm -hmm. And, um, so if you don't have a boron sufficiency, um, you don't, ex you don't, um, you don't, uh, the, 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 those, the hormones stay restrained to that. And yeah. so they don't, and normally too, like, um, okay, l like, let's say you're really sick and you have really bad metabolic problems. Um, and, but you're not like taking progesterone or anything like that. And let's say your libido is kind of going in and out and, um, What's going on there is your body, like the, the sex drive is one of the most important things that our physiology is oriented to. So your body is going to try its hardest to keep your reproductive functions working, even though a lot of other things aren't, because it's, you know, really important for the organism yeah. to reproduce and stuff. So you can still maintain um, some or a lot of uh, libido, even though you're really stressed out. And that happens because hormones like... Um, luteinizing hormone mm -hmm. and um something else oh nitric oxide um also like liberate those sex hormones and what happens when you take something like progesterone or pregnenolone or you just increase your metabolic rate sometimes your libido will actually drop because you're actually eliminating those stress hormones that stimulate the sex hormone release and so it's not a bad thing, but some people, like, I always knew when I was taking progesterone that even though my libido had dropped, that the rest of my health was getting better. And I wasn't getting a lot of action anyway, so it was fine. Yeah. Um, for, I don't know what it's like for women, but for men, a reduction in libido can kind of feel emasculating, like you're not fulfilling your potential. So that can be a little bit of worrying, but if you, if you do experience it, you can just keep in mind that it'll come back. And it'll come back even better. And it does because progesterone helps to regenerate a lot of tissues, including your um, reproductive system. So it'll actually work better when you get off of it. Um, but the reason that it slows down in the first place anyway is because of the reduction in stress hormones that have been sustaining your libido, but have also been contributing to your decline in health, but also from a deficiency of things like um, 
And um, boron, there's a few, there's a lot of complicated stuff, but boron, like another thing that um, destroys boron or gets rid of it in your body is we actually have a hormone, like there's a lot of focus on vitamin D, you know, in health circles, but yeah, there's yeah. actually a hormone in our body that destroy, actively destroys vitamin D. It's called 24 hydroxylase. And its role is to keep our metabolic rate from going overboard when we need to like conserve. Mm -hmm. Like when your body thinks it's winter time or is under stress, and it wants to conserve minerals and nutrients, it destroys vitamin D and it prevents high metabolic rate on purpose to keep you alive. Yeah. And so, and one of those, and, and that hormone actually, okay, so boron reacts with that hormone. So the more that hormone put, is put out, the less boron you have in your body. It, it just, uh, it inactivates boron and removes it from your body. So, um, wait. Um, I'm getting into too much information here now. My no, own I love brain. it. <laughs> um, uh, oh, so, and also like certain uh, tumors actually put out more of that hormone as well. Oh, so if really? you have tumors, you'll actually have an increased need for boron. So um, anyway, okay, so that was a long story. But um, if you take a boron supplement or you eat foods that are high in boron, like the highest source of boron are raisins. Okay. And actually, too, like before I found this out, too, uh, a couple of years ago, I was eating raisins like crazy, like all, every day I ate tons of raisins. And I actually had really, really great um, metabolic rate and health um, at that time. And it was because of the boron increase, retains ah. all the minerals and promotes vitamin D function. And oh, because that's the thing, if you take enough boron, it, it, it reacts with 24 hydroxylase um, and then makes vitamin D function better and this is a, another reason why a lot of people um uh have low vitamin d is because they actually just don't have enough boron in their body um apricots are also a really good source of boron you don't if you take too much boron you will get side mm. effects that's like 100 milligrams a day or more Ooh, yeah that's high um, yeah or like um it also seems to have a very long half-life mm. so you can you can take a bunch at first and saturate your body and then just go back to a lower dose it's not dangerous to take a high dose like toxic doses are way way higher than that yeah. but um i can i think i felt and i've also read that guys you can experience kind of like a weird um uh aching um feeling especially around your reproductive system if you take too much interesting but that doesn't actually seem to cause any harm it just doesn't feel great but so you can Take a dose of, like I started taking a dose about 20 milligrams a day, mm -hmm. like two or three weeks. And then I cut down to um, six to nine milligrams a day. Um, so you can take it like right before sexual activity and it'll help release sex hormones in your body. Um, but it's more helpful also just taking um, consistently. So you take progesterone, which is going to lower your stress hormones which if your libido is running off of stress hormones, your libido is going to stop. But yeah. if you take enough, if you have enough boron in your system, boron is going to take over and continually release sex hormones from the sex binding globulin. And then that is going to antagonize or counter progesterone's tendency to lower men's libido and, and affect wow. their, their genital size and completely eliminate the problem. So then you can take progesterone as long as you want um without weight gain or effects to the libido wow that is okay so i'm taking right now a supplement and it's um magnesium calcium uh mal malbidium boron and uh, is selenium it might be selenium too yeah nice that's good and now i'm like Austin, why have you not been taking uh, progesterone as often as you could be as well? Because then I take the iodine too, because I like yeah. the iodine for the gut health and everything as well. Yeah. Well, it depends on like, you don't look sick at all. And, yeah. and how are you? You're not that old. So Yeah, no, I'm 23. Yeah. Um, you know, even, even you would experience benefits of progesterone if you wanted to take it. You could yeah. shake off. A couple of years of your aging uh, you know, <laughs> do at your age. Um, it can be preventative though for the future like if you start like and especially like um, you know everyone ages during the winter time yeah. there's just not enough sunlight your body starts to shut down uh, lower the metabolic rate um, so progesterone like is a really great way to counteract that like and 
I'm not sure if like taking it during the winter time is especially helpful. Like it might not completely protect against that, but during the summertime it's going to be especially helpful because your metabolic rate is already up. You got lots of nutrients yeah. in the sunshine and then you add progesterone on top of that. You're going to regenerate like a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. We used to take uh progest E we would go fight um, and do ju- uh, like jujitsu, that style stuff, but it was always at night. And like, I literally, if I didn't take progesterone when trying to go to sleep, I always was like, someone's going to break in tonight. Like I know it, I'm going to have to use what I learned like every night or like I'd wake up out of a dream, like ready to go. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'd have to take progesterone because otherwise in like two hours, there was no way to shut my body's stress response down yeah. and like just get out of my mind. Yeah. It helped a lot, but I know you also have, you have some awesome stuff like, uh, the the radish uh peptoxidase is that horse radish yeah actually wait sorry back to progesterone real quick yeah yeah just said so like yeah um a lot of times when you are exercising if you get older or you have like metabolic issues your body is producing more lactic acid from that activity and that will give you insomnia and then yeah progesterone actually helps to um, increase your CO2 production, which is gonna inactivate your lactic acid and it'll help with stuff like that. But I also find it really funny, like one of the other side effects though, sorry, that you do get from progesterone that you can't um, uh, change is progesterone makes you feel um, emotional. It makes you feel vulnerable. Yeah. Like, you, like if you take, if you're a guy and you take it, you can experience what women feel when they are, you know, um, pregnant or, well, not yeah. the whole thing, obviously, but like yeah. the feeling like you get really vulnerable it makes you feel really loving and really like sensitive um so i was laughing imagining you like yeah fighting but you're like (laughs) seriously well like because i still use it if i go to the gym and like it's like one of those days where i'm like i am gonna be there's like i'm gonna be so sore tomorrow i know that i'm gonna be like tomorrow i'm gonna need to eat a ton of food just no matter what and like, I am noticing all that's going to go on. I'm like, I'm going to take progesterone. So I get like amazing sleep and at least can heal a little bit. It's really great. Yeah. It's, that's one of my, one of uh, my favorite hacks. I know. Um, so with the, the winter, let's, before we go into the radish, uh, we were talking about the winter and what is a light deficiency. And I think a lot of people don't even understand what a light deficiency. Yeah. Is. And it's so important too. Um, you know, it's really easy. And a lot of my approach to addressing these things, mm-hmm. I would think, I would think, I would, I kept, I would I'd try to keep in mind two tenets. And, um, you know, and this is really important too, because a lot of, a lot of any health circle, people get really bogged down on the minutia. Yep. Like one of the things that really bother me, especially are like the whole methylation like crowd. Yeah, that happens. And it is a problem, but it's not the cause. Like it's a symptom. Yeah. And when you get bogged down in the minutia, you, you cannot figure out what the solution is because the solution is not at that level. The solution is usually bigger concepts, overarching things that have to do with why we are and how we function as a species. Mm-hmm. So I would always keep this in mind when I was approaching problems. Um, I would ask why something is, like why do we even need sunlight? Like why? Yep. why? And then um, two, how does it relate to what we are as, a, as an animal, as a species, as an organism? What, what, how would that relate to our existence? So with sunlight, like why do we even need it? Well, it gives us free energy. You know, it reacts with your body. When you have direct sunlight, it gives you free energy, just like plants. Um, yeah. We don't have um, photosynthesis, but we have a similar enzyme in our body. There's actually, so the enzyme cytochrome oxidase yep actually has a rotary motor on it it's like a little molecular motor that photons hit it and it spins the motor and it creates free energy that's how cytochrome oxidase works in light so you can actually get free energy and you can also get free energy from like stretching like Mm -hmm. when you when you stretch the elongation of fiber yeah so that actually produces free energy not this as much as the sunlight but um is also one of the reasons why sometimes sunlight can be um, aggravating. Like if you're in the sun and you don't feel relaxed and happy, you're actually producing, uh, you're actually, ca- it's actually producing so much energy that you are causing oxidative damage. Like you don't have enough antioxidants in your body, mm. like vitamin C or glutathione. 
So your cells are actually being hurt by the sunlight because it's producing so much energy. There's a lot of um, ox, uh, um, um, free radicals going off and um, that's a different story. But um, if you don't, so our bodies need direct sunlight in order to function properly. And there's, there are a lot of systems in our body that react to sunlight. Oh yeah. Um, primarily in the one that really gets everybody down is the uh, serotonin, melatonin, hibernation response. Um, if you don't get regular sunlight, your body thinks it's winter time. <laughs> and what, then what happens is your body raises serotonin and melatonin. And this is like the primary cause besides diet, like, you know, obviously like, um, bad fats, uh, yeah. also lower your metabolic rate, but lack of sunlight also does in a major way because sunlight regulates whether or not our body knows that it's summertime. It's not just the access to sunlight because your body also responds to the type of wavelength. Yes. So, yep. Yeah, so depending on the quality of the light, your body knows whether it's summer or, or winter time. So you will get still some increase in metabolic rate during the summertime, even if you don't get sunlight exposure. But if you get a deficiency, your body still reacts like it's winter time and it goes into an artificial depressing of your metabolic rate. Um, it doesn't always have to be sunlight too, because you can use um, artificial light. Yeah, um, I, have a, I have a red light infrared uh, yeah. generator and I, I take methylene blue. And then I yeah. use it uh, most nights. I love it. Yeah. Um, so like I had this job a while ago where I had a window, but it's in an office building. The glass is really thick. Mm -hmm. it, at least I wasn't, there was a lot of other people that were in darker rooms, but um, okay. So this was, it was a media production company. So my, a lot of our offices are on the outside on the inside, there's like this huge bullpen with all of the like production assistants and coordinators and interns and stuff. And they had no natural light access in there at all. And they had fluorescent lights overhead. Uh -huh. And yeah, and people would come and start the job and they'd be, they're young, they're all young, they're all in their early 20s. Start the job, look fresh faced and happy. And then within six months, seriously, they all aged two or three years yep. and got angry and agitated. And it was, it's not the stress of the job. The job really wasn't that stressful at all. Like some production companies in LA are like, you work like 12 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. Really nightmares to work with. This was eight hours a day. Well, nine, including our lunch, really laid back. Like sometimes you would get yelled at, but usually it was a real nice camaraderie atmosphere. Um, it was not a stressful job. It was the lack of warm wavelengths of light and the exposure to blue fluorescent. Um, so like, so the red wavelength of light helps generate energy in your body mm -hmm. and blue light stimulates the use of that energy. So if you only are, that's one of the reasons why, um, why that's the reason why blue light is, um, prom, prom, promotes aging and isn't really helpful is it actually stimulates the use of the energy ah. without, without producing any. So these people would come and work at this job and they're under fluorescent lights and their body's actually being stimulated to overuse energy that they don't have. Yep. You know, and then on top of that, like the snacks they provide are like, yeah, <laughs> candy bars and nuts and chips and crap like that. And it was like, All the, was. yeah. And there's the, there was the token um, bowl of apples that no one ever ate. So, um, Oh, but there was, there was a group of employees there, the editors, they all work in dark bays, uh, fluorescent lights turned off. They would put tape over the, um, the motion detectors. So we yeah. turn off the lights in there. And all of them um, installed Flash like lamps. low wattage incandescent lamps. Oh. They're nice little ambience. Cause you can't have a lot of light when you're editing, um, yeah. but you don't wanna be in the total dark. So they put, so they put their own lamps in there and then just use like little incandescent watts, like 50 watt, like not, not even like a hundred. But even though those editors were in dim light, none of them had the aging side effects that the other people had. Um, because even just that little bit of extra incandescent light directly shooting on their forearms and their face was more beneficial, uh, than even me sitting in a room with a window and getting ambient light. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah. So later, you know, I started like, I have, I have lamps, like I have, like my favorite, um, is just using a 300 watt incandescent bulb. It's so warm. Oh, okay. So, and then, so like one of the underlying things, a lot of people um, aren't aware of or don't know whether or not red light is like better or than the like warm light. Mm -hmm. um, 
our tissues are red on the inside for a reason. Um, it's to filter light. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the color of the light is as long as it's not on the blue cold spectrum. Oh. Because the skin filters out all the other wavelengths and the red penetrates deeper into your tissues. Red light is helpful because the outer skin isn't red. And so it'll, you know, the, out, the very outer layers can benefit from the extra yeah. red light. But those are usually expensive. They're not yeah. usually powerful. Um, the more powerful a light is, uh, the better, the more helpful it is. So it's really, it's better to use a more powerful light than okay. necessarily to get a red one. Um, somebody I was working with recently told me they bought a 500 watt halogen light to use. <laughs> And like those things get really fucking hot, but yeah. he loved it. He only needs like five minutes of exposure on that thing to feel better. Wow. Uh, and uh, I talk about this therapy in my book about how to cure depression. And because um, there's this part of our brain called the wraith nucleus. Um, it's right in the center, kind of like lower in the back. Yeah. And um, it connects to your um, spinal column. And I think, and um it actually responds to light stimulation to the head and yep. not even from the front. It's actually more from the side and the back. Um, there was a study that um, blinded people, I mean, put, you know, covering it over there. Yeah. They, me they measured the reaction of that area of the brain to light stimulation to the sides of the head and found that that, that, the, that, that part of the brain was stimulated by wow. the contact to the skin. So, you know, light, light penetrates our bodies and it's why our, our, our tissues are translucently red. It's so that red light can get deeper in. So part of the therapy that I have for curing depression is just having a light exposure to the yeah. back or, or sides of, of your head. And if it's brighter, you know, 200, 300 watt, it's a little more helpful. Um, and it's cheap too. I mean, like my bulb well, was $3 um, and I love it. It makes me feel great. Yeah. It's, and that's, I just, that misconception in like um, most of the health circles is that like during the winter, like you should be, or like vegans are like, oh, if you're eating vegan during the winter, you'll be fine. Like all these things. And like it's light is one of the easiest things. It's readily available. It's just like going outside and getting fresh oxygen versus like the stale air that's just recycled over and over and where you are. Three dollar incandescent bulb, and you change your whole mindset of who you yeah. are. Yeah, you if you use that um, just for two weeks straight every day, your depression. As long as your diet is like you need enough vitamin C to, mm -hmm. um, your body won't increase the metabolic rate without enough antioxidants in it. So like vitamin C is part of that because um, the light stimulates an increase in metabolic rate. Yeah, and you have to have antioxidants to protect against that increase in metabolic rate. Um, so those things together wipe out depression uh, right away. So with vitamin C, what would you say for dosages for that? Uh, I do. Um, a lot of people like Linus Pauling. I love, um, yeah. but yep. for the end of his life, he was taking like 50 grams yeah. of vitamin C. Day. That's just a reflection of your iron burden. Cause iron destroys vitamin C or and vitamin C protects against iron oxidation. So the more iron you have in your body, the more vitamin mm. C. You need. So, um, so those doses aren't actually really helpful. It's better, you gotta increase your metabolic rate and get the iron out, you know, through things like progesterone and molybdenum and so yeah. and you know, and then just avoiding the really bad sources. Um, so you don't actually need a lot of vitamin C, um, but most people don't even get enough. And the, the 100 uh, milligram yeah. mark is just not enough. Like our, a lot of our, our primate relatives consume up to like a gram of vitamin C a day through their diet. And if you're getting like 500, 600, like that's like a really good amount. Like you gotta, you gotta really focus on make sure you get enough because it's our primary um, yeah. exogenous um, antioxidant. So if you don't get enough, you just, your metabolic rate doesn't run high enough. So, but I have this really great, um, oh, so a lot of synthetic vitamin D, C though can be allergenic and it can make really? you feel complicated. Yeah, if it's corn a lot of uh, most of it's made from corn oh. and you know, ray pete was worried that uh there's a heavy metal used in the reaction and that was the problem but i i think it's just the corn source like the corn yeah. you know, corn is just really not great and um i take uh one that's made from tapioca and it's just amazing i never get any bad reaction from really it. yeah 
And you can also buy natural vitamin C as a supplement yeah. too. So there's a lot of options, but um, yeah, just taking about like 500 to a gram, like is usually enough. I'll sometimes take two just for fun. Um, yeah. And it's best in the morning, like, you know, you wake up, you get your metabolic rate going. Vitamin C is part of that. So it's, it's really helpful in the morning, but then, oh, you know, perfect. therapies in my book that it's a part yeah. of too so yeah. yeah one of the uh a couple of the most interesting ones were it's the the b12 um to get rid of the metals in your body high dose b12 um no um uh pesticides pesticides uh, yes yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and then also the that isn't a total i that's i don't guarantee that in the book that's yeah. what there's studies that show that bacteria use b12 to detoxify um dioxins and so I'm assuming that it also has that function in our body. Um, Cause B12 also has a lot of other benefits. It turns on your, like um, your uh, methionine, um, yeah. methionine um, uh, recycling. So it has a lot of functions that way. I think that it does protect against uh, dioxins, which are so ubiquitous in our environment though. Oh, I mean, they're every, I mean, look at Monsanto just finally lost. Yeah. Uh, so many. <laughs> That's that's literally. I'm just hoping like every single person ever just starts suing them. Yeah, I mean, um, I want farmers to be able to like you know not deal with weeds, but like not at the expense of our health. Like we don't need to be doing that. It's, no, we're we're not the weeds. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like it's completely backwards. Um, yeah, that brings us to glycine, which is really really important. A lot of my therapies, you know, a lot of things in the body rely on glycine, and and it, you get you get pesticides in there and dioxins, and then glyphosate uh, which is the weed killer which yep. is rep. and um you know that shuts down like your primary like antioxidant systems and it just makes life miserable and it, it's pretty easy to avoid if you just take a little bit of effort so yeah so we're gonna return like real real far back to when you were a swimmer getting all yeah. that chlorine mm -hmm. the fluoride constantly because of course like you take a drink accidentally while you're taking yeah. that left turn in the pool um <laughs> yeah we swallowed a lot of water <laughs> yeah i mean i've seen i mean i know and then anybody who just starts learning to swim is like how do you not swallow water it's <laughs> like eh, well it's gonna take a while um and you're probably gonna be beat down a little bit by that point but with chlorine and fluoride those are two of what i think is one of the the most readily available toxins Besides polyunsaturated fats, because I think they, that's in every food, and then fortification of irons and everything as well. How do you start to limit that or oh, get rid of it? So, well, um, we don't actually have fluoride here in LA. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's not one I have to deal with, and I haven't really done much work on. I I do agree that it's not helpful and it should be avoided at all costs. You know, don't use fluoride toothpaste. Baking <laughs> toothpaste is so great and it works way so, better. Um, like, okay, so like, let's let's talk about that because that's a really great illustration of why fluoride is even around. Yep. The reason that fluoride is in toothpaste is to kill uh, bacteria in your mouth. The problem is, is that we need good bacteria in our mouth. Um, good bacteria in our mouth actually helps protect the health of your gums. You use fluoride, it kills off a lot of bacteria. The ones that, then that actually supports um, uh, uh, more harmful species that are more resistant to the effects of those things. And it also, like most of our good bacterial populations are there to protect us from the bad ones. So you kill off the good ones and the bad ones just move in real easy. The other thing is that um, uh, bacteria in the mouth that contribute to uh, tooth decay they actually feed on food particles to produce acids that support their populations. And those acids deteriorate the enamel and then allow their ingress into the um, tooth structure. So um, toothpaste like baking soda are way more effective anyway because yeah. baking soda changes the pH. And, that, and the mouth is supposed to be alkaline. So using um, baking soda toothpaste is way more effective than fluoride anyway because it keeps the pH of the mouth in a point that only allows the good bacteria to survive and prevents um, enamel um, erosion. And um, it tastes better anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's just uh, easy. I mean, you can even just use straight up baking soda. Yeah. Um, it's not that pleasant. It's kind of gross, but 
basically yeah. two face is great and that's fine. Um, so like that's one way that you can do it. Um, you know, I don't really drink water. I drink so many other beverages all the time, yeah. like coffee and orange juice and milk that I get plenty of fluids. Um, once in a while I'll have a craving for water and I'll buy like a bottle of sparkling mineral water or something like that. So those are great ways to avoid those two. Um, I noticed a long time ago when I was early in dealing with my cancer was okay. So one of the, one of the worst side effects that I had from my cancer was this chronic cough mm -hmm. and it would like, it was really weird because especially when I would, I would lay down at night, it felt, well, what actually was happening was the edema and swelling that happened from my deteriorated metabolic state, mm. you know, is, is loose water in the body. And when I would lay down, that water would redistribute from my lower extremities all the way up. It would just, you know, redistribute. Yeah. Was it a pulmonary edema then? Yeah. And so that water would then in flood my lungs and cause coughing spasms. And that contributed to my insomnia really bad. I would, I, once it started after I laid down, I would cough for four or five hours. Wow. Um, but I noticed, so after about a year into peeing, I, um, my cough would still occur and it would occur a lot during the day. And one day I noticed it was happening right after I took a shower. And that was just so weird. I was like, why is it just the warm water? Um, then I thought that it was probably the, the chlorine and I was like, did a little bit of work and I, I found out that also like places like LA have switched from using just traditional chlorine to using chloramide, which is chlorine and ammonia together. And it's even worse than chlorine. <laughs> and it's, but it's, it's promoted is because the chlorine is reactive to ammonia. It doesn't react with other substances and cause harmful things, but it's harmful itself. So it's not really like, it's just weird. So, and it's, it's more, it's also more persistent. Like chlorine evaporates really quickly. Yeah. Um, like iodine as a, um, what are they? Halides? Is that what they're called? Yeah. Halogen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, halides. They um, evaporate into the air, but chlor chloramines don't because it's reacted to ammonia. Uh. It's much more persistent and it becomes gaseous when you take a shower and it's fine if you're healthy. It's not really a problem. It's more of a problem for people who have compromised metabolic state. People who are already sick are really susceptible to those kinds of things. So I installed a chlorine, a vitamin C filter on my shower. Yeah. It doesn't get all of it, but it get it got it enough that it stopped my coughing. And it was so it was really great. And it was just it was it's not that expensive. I think it was like um, I think it was like thirty dollars for the apparatus. Oh. And the refills are like. 15 or 20 or something like that and I mean, for your awesome. health yeah it also makes a shower better because like the chlorine dries out your skin and if you can buy the, you know if you want to buy the more expensive ones too um those are really great um something interesting about chlorine a couple of years ago when i, I had this little chihuahua yeah um, that i found on the street he was really adorable and but he had these um this really persistent eye problem he had um uh, it was a chronic dry eye and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't let him, the eyelid run right. It would dry out so bad that his eyelid would stick to his eye and it caused him a lot of pain. And we went to vet after vet. They, the, um, they gave us like interferon and like eye drops. And then mm -hmm. the last vet eventually he recommended we have surgery where they reroute his salivary duct into his eye so those to use the saliva to lubricate the eye but then we had to feed him a special diet to change the ph of the eye of the saliva so it wouldn't dissolve the eye this just sounded like a nightmare and i was like and expensive it was like five thousand dollars and um that sounded like it would be a really miserable quality of life for him yeah and apparently these dry eye problems are really common in dogs and i just we just decided to give him eye drops for the rest of his life and um we had to give them to him three times a day, every single day. And one day I decided to start giving my dogs water from the um, refrigerator uh, yeah. output. And about a week after doing that, his eye started producing its own tears again. And I was just amazed. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And so I just, we just gave him refri filtered refrigerator water and his, we stopped having to give him drops about three months into that and never gave him drops ever again. 
And the reason that he had those eye problems was because of the chlorine in the tap water that we were giving them because chlorine also destroys vitamin C. And dogs don't eat vitamin C, but they produce their own, but they only need a little tiny bit. So they only produce a little tiny bit. And even in a smaller little dog, he's not producing any. The chlorine was enough to completely destroy all the vitamin C in his body and destroy organs like his tear ducts that needed vitamin C in order to produce, to produce the tears. So even just that charcoal filter in the refrigerator was enough to remove chlorine to benefit. Yeah. So doing little things like that can really help mitigate your exposure to chlorine. Um, yeah, and if you're a swimmer, you got to take um, vitamin C and iodine every day to prevent the the bad effects of chlorine you know and like chlorine is like weird because we have we actually use chloride in our body to be yeah. healthy. like it's an element that we need but in just the ionic form of chlorine um you we can't really manage it it reacts to things and it robs our body of stuff that's vulnerable to reaction with it so um it's not that it's a universal poison mm -hmm. is just not compatible with our physiology the way that we are. So if you take some steps to do to address it, like using iodine and taking vitamin C, you can usually mitigate the effects of it. So yeah, and you were talking about the baking soda, um, baking soda with uh, apple cider vinegar. I tried that for a while to create. Uh, oh yeah, uh, sodium acetate. Sodium acetate to help with lactate or lactase problems. Yeah, this stuff is crazy. Like I couldn't believe that it was also so easy to get a hold of because it's your science fair volcano project. <laughs> when you're a kid, you could eat in it and it help protect your health. Yeah, doctors um, apparently use it in hospitals to address acidosis mm -hmm. as a backup or alternative to using sodium, straight up sodium bicarbonate. Um, and all the studies that I was reading about it too showed that uh, the people who used, who were on the sodium acetate actually had a better outcome than people who were on sodium bicarbonate and it was more effective. Um, it's not that great tasting. <laughs> no. Um, but our, you know, our, most of our acetic acid comes from, is supposed to come from our healthy gut bacteria. And if you don't have healthy gut bacteria, your body just isn't producing acetic acid. And acetic acid is the basis for so many things in the body. It's the basis for cholesterol and steroids. And you know, it's involved in, um, uh, what is it, acetyl-CoA, that coenzyme. Yeah, yep. It's so important. There, I, there's so many things that rely on acetic acid. And if you don't have enough, your metabolic rate just is not going to work. So using sodium acetate to replace what is missing from a state of a bacterial dysbio of gut dysbiosis is really helpful. Um, I wish it was a supplement and it's really weird that it's not because everyone is so gung ho about yep. kombucha and, and apple cider vinegar um, that no, no supplement companies yet have decided to make that in a form that's not as fucking disgusting as apple cider vinegar. Yeah. And also, you should know this too, that you know, using straight up apple cider vinegar or vinegar is not a great idea all the time because it actually, the unreacted acetic acid will react with your tooth in animal. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, and it'll, it'll, it'll erode your tooth enamel if you use it. Yeah, one of my friends, um, Trent McCloskey, he actually asked you about vitamin B or B12 a long time ago, how to get what form. Um, thought he was lactose intolerant and basically he's gotten rid of it by warming up all uh milk uh, yeah. cool. he makes yeah. sugar milk and then using the acetic acid trick uh with yeah. the baking soda yeah yeah it's, um yeah it's really helpful stuff i would love to see a supplement come out that's uh for acetic acid and you would and you would react it with all of the major minerals that we need so you get a mineral supplement along with huge amounts of acetic mm. acids you get sodium acetate potassium acetate calcium acetate magnesium acetate um and you could probably even put zinc and boron in there and then yeah you get a huge dose of acetic acid in a way that you can actually take because it's already reacted to all those minerals and then you also get those minerals as well it would be really great but until that day we have to do science experiments every yeah, yeah. just put a little juice in it and it tastes not too bad though that's what yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've actually found, okay, so I didn't write this down because potassium can be really dangerous. 
but you can use potassium um, carbonate to in the same concoction and the uh, and then so half potassium and half sodium mm -hmm. almost completely eliminates the taste really yeah it's really really great um potassium can totally stop your heart if you take too much of it without enough sodium in your body so it's really dangerous and yeah. although i think i've seen that potassium carbonate is actually less dangerous than like other supplements of potassium um, but yeah, it's really weird. There's a law that won't allow potassium supplements to be more than a hundred milligrams of potassium, even though we need about 4,000 milligrams yeah. of potassium a day because potassium can, uh, stop your heart. Interesting. Uh, that only happens if you don't have enough sodium. Um, uh, but a lot of, a lot of people who are metabolically ill don't have enough sodium. Your body's losing it and you're not getting enough. Yeah. So it can be really dangerous. So, but if you use that sodium acetate recipe that I have, you can, you know, you can use equal parts um, sodium bicarbonate and potassium bicarbonate, which can be, potassium bicarbonate is really used widely in the food industry, so you can mm -hmm. get huge bags of it. Um, and you put equal parts in, and it actually makes it, t it almost completely cancels out the taste. Um, cool. And so it's, uh, that's actually a lot more pleasant. And then you get a potassium supplement too, but don't ever use the potassium alone. It should always be accompanied with sodium. Oh yeah. Yeah. I eat so much salt now. It's probably ridiculous. But at one point my friend group would carry around bags of white powder and it was like baking soda, sugar, uh, sea salt. It was just everything. And it's like, Oh, we're at a restaurant gelatin. And we're just like pouring it on everything that we're eating. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. I try to start every day with salt dissolved in water. It's better yep. to put it in the water if it's pre-dissolved. Um, uh, yeah, that really gets your me metabolic rate up really fast. Oh, yeah. No, I love that. So there's a few questions that I got to ask, and then we will get going um, just unique to height and living. So one of them is, what is your higher leverage skill? And that's a skill that you learn in one field or um, you came to uh, the realization or an ideology uh, that while doing something, you could use this one skill to help you learn anything and get to where you are today uh it's something like learning to learn or pattern recognition or something that you can apply to so many different things um it's not necessarily one of those but it's just one of the skills that you use most often to get to where you are now myself or for other people to do um we'll do both yeah um well Wait, I'm not, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean. Yeah, so like learning to learn is a higher leverage skill because if you learn to learn, you can learn anything better. Learning yeah. to breathe better. That's one of the way, that's, yeah, that's actually one of the, I had that in mind writing my book because if you yeah. teach people how to, like, so I coach a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And right away what I found out with people is if I didn't give them enough um, information and skills to do it on their own that I was handholding and babysitting yep. and that's not effective because you can't do stuff for other people and then they don't understand why to do it and then it's not effective so like one of the biggest tools that I gave people was learning how to measure your pulse and temperature mm -hmm. and it's really basic but it's the most effective thing you can do for your health because if you it's a direct reflection of your metabolic rate yeah. So it tells you exactly the state of your health and exactly what is going on at various times of the day in reaction to your lifestyle and what you eat and what, you know, and then you can use that as a way to um, also monitor your progress. And so it's not vague. It's not nebulous. You go to the doctor, like you go to the doctor every like six months, you have to wait till you go there and you have to wait yeah. for him to call you back and you have to wait for all these things. And then you don't even understand really what's going on mm -hmm. anyway. Measuring your pulse and temperature directly shows you exactly what's going on in your body. It's this exact reflection of the state of your hormones. Um, you know, for instance, if you have, if you wake up in the morning and you have high temperature and low pulse, you have high cortisol because cortisol um, stimulates temperature, but not heart rate and adrenaline stimulates heart rate, but not always temperature. Sometimes it will. Yeah. Um, so you can use it as a diagnostic tool is really helpful. Um, I don't know. One of the things I guess, uh, again, I talk about it in my book a little bit is kind of like um, uh, acknowledging reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like 
we all want to believe certain things and we want things to be true. Um, you know, when I was younger and I would starve myself, I wanted to believe that it was healthy for me, even though I really kind of knew that yeah. it wasn't. Um, and, you know, you have like really getting at what is true rather than what you want to be true will take you so much farther and it's oh, yeah. i'm not really good at it i have a lot of like things i don't like about myself or about my life that i will tend to try to ignore and just and try to focus on the good things but um that always just comes from a fear of the unknown and what you can't control yeah. and like, in my book i have um a practice that i learned from aa that's called personal inventory and it is the most effective mental therapy that i have ever done in my life and i've had a lot of mental therapy yeah and um you know, it really helps you look at things the way they are. And that doesn't even mean that they're unpleasant. A lot of the reasons why we avoid certain uncomfortable things um, is because we don't actually understand them. Mm -hmm. um, like, say, for instance, if you have abuse trauma in your past, you know, or you have a, you know, a relationship that isn't working out or that didn't work out that destroyed you, or you know you have um, weight problems and health problems, or you have financial issues. Um, that practice of personal inventory actually yeah. helps you to tease apart what you're actually responsible for and what you're not responsible for. And it turns a lot of us carry around a lot of stuff that we aren't actually responsible for. Yeah, like it is not our fault that we are mortal and that we succumb <laughs> to physical stressors. It's not our fault. Yeah. You it is not your fault that you're fat, that you are um, have insomnia, that you have alcoholism or drug problems. It is not your fault that you like, you know, did something horrible when you were a kid and regret it, you know, like, um, I mean, you can, you know, obviously, but you're a kid, you don't have that, you don't have the tools. And especially if you grew up, if maybe if you had abusive parents, um, you, you probably weren't given the tools that a, a healthy person needs to live their life effectively and that is not your fault so doing a practice like personal inventory mm -hmm. actually makes your life easier because it helps really it helps you really see what you're responsible for and in the end there's a very very little bit of our life that we're actually responsible for um and the rest of it is kind of just um left up to factors that are way bigger than ourselves and um right. you know a lot of people live their life thinking that um they have to make it they have to force other people to um, accept them and to give them jobs and to help them be successful. And it, it is so stressful to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, to defy biology. I mean, it's just, that's the reason my book is called Fuck Portion Control. Yeah. I grew up with this family that believes that you can affect biology. Like, and you can't. <laughs> like, you know, if you do happen to eat the right foods and have, uh, and your parents ate the right foods and your grandparents ate the right foods, you know, that's like, Yes. I mean, but that stuff's not even in your control. You can control what food you eat, but you can't. Um, you can't control the health of your parents when you were conceived, which affects your health too. Exactly. So you know. So yeah. So like doing stuff like that is like that was probably that that practice is what enabled me to go down the route of writing my book and figuring all these things out because it freed me from a lot of the. Um, trauma and burdens that I was carrying around that got in the way of that. So yeah, I would like, and the way I put it in my book though, like a was great. And it like the people that developed that practice yeah, happened to intuitively stumble upon the psychological processes that um, develop memory and learning and that kind of stuff. So it's not about that and it's not religious. It's more, it's really just a yeah. chart with five different categories that separate a, a, an event in your life into its different components. And it's so great and it's really easy to do and it's really, really effective. And uh, that's, yeah, that would be definitely like the most oh, yeah. effective thing I've ever learned to do. Um, that's benefited my life. So that is awesome. So is there anything right now that you're currently questioning and this could be life, how doorknobs work, religion, politics, <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, Hmm. I don't know. That's a really esoteric question. Yeah. It's just something that lately you've been thinking about a lot and everybody's like, yeah, it works this way. And you're like, I just don't think it does. Oh, like 
like maybe more health stuff or like health concepts yeah definitely could be yeah um i don't know my brain i've been writing my book and doing all of this like figuring all these things out has been doing it now really intensely for the last two years my focus has been so singular yeah, yeah. i haven't been able to really expand um into a lot of other stuff i one thing I did recently find out that was interesting, I had a, and I, I wrote an article about it and I put it up, but I wanted to do more work on it, uh, was, you know, the generation before us, baby boomers? Yeah. They're all really angry. Yeah, yeah. The whole population of them are super angry. And this happened because my parents are part of that generation and um, they're not fun to be around. They have all of these issues that just make it impossible to have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And I was getting really down on myself about it and, and, our, and, our, and how poor our relationship is and blaming them. And I had the thought, I was actually driving back home from a family uh, trip and I realized that our, the baby boomers went through a huge amount of trauma when they were children yeah. from the Cold War. Like, you know, they were told almost every day of their life that imminent death by immolation um, was going to come from this omnipotent source at any time, you know, mm -hmm. and like the to grow up under that, uh, I can't imagine what that'd be like, but it is also like what a lot of kids are going through nowadays where with school shootings, where they are often living in constant fear of that, of yeah. that happening. I didn't, I was lucky my generation, our generation, we didn't actually, I don't think you did, but we didn't have to mm -hmm. do any of that. Like, during the Clinton years when I was in school, yeah. there was no um, trauma like that at all. So the eighties were just a really, in nineties were just a really nice comfy period. So uh, anyway, yeah. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna do more explore. I think that probably deserves totally. some generation into that. But I was really angry about it for a while because I was, I was blaming their generation for being that way. But, um, yeah. but like everything, uh, humans are um, impressionable and they're affected by lots of external factors and it's not always necessarily their fault that it's that totally. way. Um, so I guess that's maybe, I guess yeah, yeah. Uh, culpability is what I've been focusing on a lot lately and whether or not people, cause even like my ex who was really terrible to me, he had a really horrible abusive childhood. And if mm -hmm. I had been in that situation, I'd probably be exactly the same way. And as much as I don't like their behavior, um, it isn't entirely uh there are bigger factors than us that aren't our responsibility that totally need to be just considered, so. literally and that's how it is for everything when we try to look at one piece we're missing a hundred other ones yeah. Yeah. awesome well this was awesome where can people find you when is the next edition of the book coming out and i have so many more questions that uh if you want to come on ever again yeah if you yeah uh, write them down and hit me up we'll do an another session again um awesome. so my blog is fuckportioncontrol.com uh i'm on instagram mostly at nate hatch but it's i spelled i changed that nate hatch was taken so i spelled it n-a-y-t-e-h-a-t-c-h um and that's i don't use twitter I'm on, I'm on Facebook less, but I have a Facebook page for, I, I have a Facebook page for my book so that I can post updates for the book. So if you like the book or you want to get the updates, if you subscribe to that on Facebook, I, but I do also post it on my personal Facebook. Um, so you can do those two things. Um, my update, I think I'm going to be done with it in a month. I'm perfect. Um, depending on how some things go. Uh, and, and anyone who already bought the book will receive those updates by email by the email they put in when they purchased it. Um, so you'll get that. And then um, I'm gonna do a, I think I'm gonna do a book sale to clear out all the current copies. So if you if you don't like the price of it, it's a heavy book and it costs a lot to print. Yeah. So yeah. it's not cheap, but um, uh, I'm gonna I'll put it at cost uh, to clear out the old copies. So if you want a copy of that and then you'll receive the updates and then the new version will be out later. Um, after that uh, awesome awesome well i'm looking forward to it because i love nerding out and just figuring out uh how to yeah. use the oh, body I, more an update that I, I didn't think it would be that much i have talked a lot actually about the things that were some of the things that were in there that are now in there um that weren't there before but, uh, 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And then we'll definitely do another one of these soon then. Yeah. Um,